uh, before I introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, I want to begin by expressing uh, my deep gratitude and thanks to Paul Ice um, and the Center for the Arts and Society and to the School of Drama for their ongoing support and sponsorship of the Performance and Ecology Project um, and through it, today's lecture. Um, that project has produced a number of events over the last three years, including a panel on greening the future of live performance and the Pittsburgh Eco Drama Festival. And it is going to culminate next year with three major events. Uh, first, the devising of an eco performance led by guest director Andy Mora in the fall. Um, second, the publication of an anthology titled Readings in Performance and Ecology, co-edited by myself and my colleague Teresa May at the University of Oregon, which is coming out from Palgrave next spring. And finally, the hosting of the third Earth Matters on Stage Symposium here at CMU in June 2012. So lots of exciting stuff coming up. As director of that project, it has been my aim over the last three years to call attention to the power of performance, to raise awareness about ecological issues, to stimulate activism, build coalitions, and move and inspire spectators to action. And more than any other scholar I can think of, our guest today, Professor Disoyini Madison, exemplifies those goals. I first became aware of Professor Madison's work when my own scholarship took an ethnographic turn in the mid-2000s, and I picked up her book, Critical uh, Ethnography. This insightful work not only outlines a theory and method for translating ethnographic data to the public stage, but also argues persuasively that scholars and artists can exercise principles of advocacy and engaged ethics through a public staging of ethnography, which she calls a critical performance ethnography. Her most recent book uh, in 2010, Acts of Activism, Human Rights as Radical Performance, amplifies this theory and methodology and also presents three case studies in acts of activism that exemplify how performance is employed in the defense of human rights and the actualization of social justice. Professor Madison's writing here, as in her earlier work, bridges scholarship, artistic practice, and activism. In the past decade alone, she has researched, devised, co-written, and directed performance pieces on subjects ranging from the oral histories of workers at the University of North Carolina, to the life and work of Nelson Mandela, to the complicated and volatile debate surrounding the practice of trokosi, which is a form of ritual servitude in Ghana in which women and girls are indentured to religious shrines in reparation for crimes committed by members of their family. Her work on water rights and the political economy of water, which she will share with us today, links her scholarship and her activism to both ecological issues and questions of environmental justice. Her research documents connections between globalization, local governmental policies, privatization, and environmental degradation as root issues in the fight for water democracy in Ghana. And the performances, she, the performance that she developed out of that research makes those connections heartfelt and real for performers and audience members in the United States, most of whom have the privilege of taking the availability of abundant water wholly for granted. One of the things I admire most about Professor Madison's work is the way that she continually foregrounds and interrogates her own positionality as not only investigator and researcher, but as a human being with a deep interconnectedness to the human beings whose lives she witnesses. She brings her doubts about her rights and responsibilities as a witness, recorder, and analyst to light at every turn, encouraging us as readers and spectators to reflect similarly on our own connectedness, rights, and responsibility vis-a-vis -vis others. Professor Madison's research and activism has been recognized in the form of numerous awards, including the Tanner University Award at Chapel Hill for Outstanding and Inspirational Teaching, the National Communication Association Spotlight on Scholars, the J. William Fulbright Senior Scholar Award, and a Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Research Award. She's published five books, as well as articles in leading journals like Performance Research, the Journal of Cultural Studies, and Text and Performance Quarterly, among others. And of particular interest to me was to see that she has also added her voice to the contemporary U.S. political debate in essays on Michelle Obama, angry post-black women, and crazy patriotism. <laughs> Professor Madison is a model of activist, engaged, ecologically mindful scholarship and artistic praxis. Please join me in warmly welcoming her to Carnegie Mellon University.
My compliments to most deaf. Um, this is one of the scenes from our uh, production at Chapel Hill, Water Rights. This afternoon I will share with you what happens when ethnography and performance conjoin to dramatize the political economy of water. I will share moments from two locations, my field work in Ghana with local water activists and scenes from the performance Water Rights presented at UNC Chapel Hill in March 2006 at Swain Hall. My work in recent years, more organically than by design, makes economy theatrical and makes politics more about affect than argument. I don't set out to make a political performance. Like most of us, I set out to make a performance about those things I care about. About those things I most care about happen to be ethnographic in content, form, tone, and imagination. This means both honoring and taking refuge in the small story, like my small microphone that I have to turn on. Here we go. <laughs> this means both honoring and taking refuge in the small story. My father, who was a labor union activist in Chicago, used to say that you must find meaning first in the small. William Blake's famous dictum that you can see the world in a grain of sand. In the contested space of ethnographic inquiry, there are a myriad of small stories located in the everyday, all of them constituted by a political economy, a constitution that I cannot ignore, because if I ignore it, I cannot tell the story. Those micro moments within the everyday, the god of small things, daily rituals of belonging, symbolic acts of resistance, customary gestures of affection, and the small stories circling within other small stories, ancient and new, written and told, that bring not only flesh, blood, and bone to discourses of democracy, globalization, and empire, but they bring extended dimensions of accuracy, specificity, and passion to the macro economies of global networks. My work explores how the performative of felt sensing bodies and small stories can unlock the material reality as much as sometimes more than explorations of superstructure of governance, state, and nation. So when I talk about a political economy of water or a political economy of performance, I am obviously talking through Foucault's well-known notion when he says, quote, the control of society over individuals is not conducted only through consciousness of ideology, but also in the body and with the body. For capitalist society, biopolitics is most important, the biological, the somatic, the corporeal. The social body is comprised by power's machine and developed in its virtuality. So, the water rights performance must be a process of putting flesh onto the issues of water. We are performing embodied knowledges about water. This, according to Brian Alexander, quote, means or reflects that the body as a conduit of being, the body as the materiality of presence, the body as the nexus of need, and the body as a, as a site of knowing. From Bourdieu to Merleau-Ponty to Sarah Ahmed, the body knows and feels and does beyond being. Sarah Ahmed states, quote, bodies do not dwell in space that are exterior, but rather are shaped by their dwelling and take shape in dwelling. Spaces are not exterior to bodies. Instead, spaces are like a second skin that unfolds in the folds of the body. Therefore, the creation, accumulation, and distribution of wealth not only affects the operations of nations and stories, but the small, embodied, intimate spaces that shelter us. How we make our food, dress ourselves, let, learn to labor, choose who we love, remember our past and create our futures, and how we make culture. In this day and age, can you be an economist without some basic understanding of culture and how it is produced? 
Can you be a cultural critic and maker without some basic understanding of economics and the processes of political economy? The show, Water Rights. This was the confrontation. These were the facts. The fact is that more than one billion people lacked access to clean, affordable water. About two billion people lack access to sanitation. The fact is that in the urban areas of Ghana, only 40% of the population has a water tap that is flowing. 78% of the poor in urban areas do not have piped water. The fact is that treated water is available only to about 65% in urban areas and only about 35% in rural areas. The fact is that waterborne diseases kill one child every eight seconds and that in sub-Saharan Africa, almost 70% of deaths and disease are due to the lack of clean and accessible water. The majority of women and children in rural areas travel miles in the morning and evening for water that remains infected with waterborne diseases. The World Health Organization's daily requirement for water is 20 to 40 liters a day per person. In Ghana, for those without a piped water system, purchasing three buckets or 18 liters a day can cost between 10 to 20 percent of their daily income. The fact is that over 5 million people in a year die from illnesses linked to unsafe drinking water, unclean domestic environments, and improper sanitation. They are mostly under 5 years of age. At any time, over half the population of the developing world suffers from diseases associated with water and sanitation. The performance, water rights. The posters and announcements for Water Rights described it as a multimedia performance on the politics and poetics of water. Water Rights explored water activism and our human relationship with water through a montage of digital imagery, comic satire, dramatic monologue, and stylized movement. Water Rights reflected how we all perform water rights in our everyday lives and how these rights variously pervade our culture beautifully, happily, and tragically. Water rights perform the questions, what is our first memory of water? Does anyone have the right to own water? Are water wars still taking place in the 21st century? What is the connection between local water and global profit? Included in the announcements for the show was the famous or infamous 1995 quote from a former president of the World Bank, quote, if the water wars of the 20th century were fought over oil, the wars of this century will be fought over water." Unquote. I hope the performance would inspire and disturb the audience and a group of performers relative to the quest for water and how the lack of it pervades the everyday lives of countless individuals on this planet. I hope to build a performance community because water rights was as much a pedagogical experiment for this group of students as it was a stage performance for an audience. Therefore, the end product of the show would be only as good as what my students learned about water and how well and how deeply they felt they learned it together. This meant my students must have a love affair with water during the performance process. They must acquaint themselves with water anew and differently, with feelings of reverence and believing that water is precious. They must emotionally, emotionally learn to love water. And even more, they must care about how each other learn to love water be the, before they could truthfully perform what is ultimately about the political economy of water. Public water over private water water as a human right, over water as an economic good, the, lo the local donkey cart seller over corporate business. Now I want to share excerpts from the show Water Rights while weaving those excerpts with field work in Ghana and moments from the rehearsal, the video. Rehearsal two.
This was a video that we began our show with and that began this particular rehearsal moment. about the politics of water, I must teach about the spirit of water. Before there is politics, I really believe there is a soul. We are all water, and water is all of us. Water is living, changing, and responsive. To believe this is the purpose of rehearsal, too. There are 18 of us. We are all sitting together on the floor in a large circle. The room is dark. On the floor in front of each of us is a candle. The only light in the room is a flame from each of our candles. I ask the performers to breathe deeply and look into the flame. I say to them, feel the quiet in the room and focus on the flame. I look into the light of the flame and how it moves against the darkness. I stop speaking and the room is quiet. We enjoy the quiet and the flame for a few more seconds. I look around and they are focused, making the transition from the noisiness and busyness of their daily self into this temporality of a water right rehearsal. I break the silence, I say. Please look into the flame, be still and just feel quiet. Now close your eyes. Two of my assistant directors for this show, Anissa Clark and Elizabeth Nelson, begin reading passages from Masara Umoto's The Hidden Message of Water. They end that section with this passage. Anissa, sound and water, we are all water. Music affects the frequency, current, fluctuation, vibration of water. This means that sound affects the frequency of water. Sounds affect the cells in our body that are made up of water. Elizabeth, we must recover our desire to treat water with respect. Anissa, if we dialogue with water lovingly and with respect, water will change. Water in your body will change. Anissa, finally, she says, we must pay respect to water, feel love and gratitude, and receive vibrations with a positive attitude. Then water changes, you change, and I change, because both you and I are water. I asked the actors to open their eyes and share a word or phrase that impressed them, that stuck with them, and that they will want to remember. 
When all have spoken, I will conclude the rehearsal by asking them to read from their journal assignment on memory and their first discovery or recognition of water. It is my turn now. I am now reading from my journal notes. I am my most vulnerable ever as a teacher when I read to my students from my field notes. I read now and they listen. How they are listening at this moment, what they feel, what they think, I simply cannot gauge at all. I continue reading, shaking and scared, trying to gather the confidence that however they are receiving what I read at this moment, it is my experience and it is true and deeply dear to me and above all necessary for them to know. Journal entry, September 10, 1998, a day at the market. I was standing at the Trotro stop trying to get a bus back home. It was so hot that day. I'm in Accra, Ghana. I can hardly breathe and nothing could quench the thirst. Every Trotro that passed by was filled with people packed together, crushed inside, trying to get where they needed to go. A stream of dilapidated old vans full of exhaust fumes, sweaty bodies, overbearing heat and the smells, the smells. Everything felt so crowded and so dirty that day, so dirty. I was hot and tired and missing my home in the U.S. and feeling very much like the ugly American. As I waited, hoping a trotro would come so I could squeeze into one empty seat and get back to the quiet and solitude of my flat at Lagon. I looked down the road a bit and saw a woman. She was sitting over a bucket of soapy water. There was a child at her feet. She undressed the child and then placed him in the bucket of water. She was bathing the child in the public marketplace. Quiet and solitude for her are a different reality than they are for me. I was transfixed by what was more than just a woman bathing a child outside in a hot, crowded market. But how the ordinary, how the day to day is so strong and impeccably resilient against the fact of its own reality. As I watched the woman and child, suddenly an old man appeared to be mad. He appeared to be mad. His hair was all matted. He was half dressed with very dirty, very dirty clothes. And he walked up to the woman and the child. Without the least concern, she simply brushed him away with a wave of her hand and to continue to bathe the child. The man, undeterred, filthy, very filthy and dirty, stumbled toward the bucket and began taking off his clothes. And he attempted to step into the soapy water with the baby. Immediately, two young men standing next to me at the Trotro stop quickly walked over to the old man and with such sincere gentleness and gracious respect, helped the man put his clothes on and then guided him down the road. The woman, paying no mind to the old man, no mind to anyone or anything around her, kept her willful attention on her child and their ritual. For much of the global south, specifically Africa, dirt is a fact and a symbol. Dirty people having dirty children with dirty faces wearing dirty clothes. Dwight Conkergood stated, quote, labeling someone or something dirty is a way of controlling perceived anomalies, incongruities, contradictions, ambiguities, all that does not fit into our categories and therefore threatens cherished principles. Dirt then functions as the mediating term between, as Mary Douglas states, difference and danger, unquote. We know that dirt is to be gotten rid of, but we tend to forget that dirt will dwell while water is inaccessible. Nor do we sometimes remember that when sanitation systems are impaired or non-existent, dirt embraces disease. The other bodies, the loathsome bodies, the dirty bodies, the disfigured bodies, the sick body, the body that smells of refuge, the body that oozes, excretes, and cannot shelter its waste. 
the bodies grotesquely out of place are the bodies that wrenching poverty will breed in its abominable lack. Discuss and circles these bodies with visceral loathing and fear, fear of nearness and the threat of contamination, loathing for the failure of these bodies to keep themselves out of sight. Dirt is a factor of economic and political conditions, but as a tactical deflection is generally cast as a moral flaw. But in this small moment, on a hot day in a crowded African market, a woman bathes her child, a water right, real and resistant. The performance, Ibrahim. The performance section entitled Ibrahim, you can turn that down a little bit. We actually don't. This is footage I took of my field work at a pond one day. I was trying to hold the camera steady, but I was stumbling because it, the ground was uneven and the water was very muddy and it was hard to um, get my balance. The performance section, Ibrahim focuses on a young donkey cart seller at a pond in a town called Savalugu, located in northern Ghana. The purpose of this segment was to personalize young men who sell water by situating them as subjects within their own story and their own individual history. The donkey cart seller is a composite character named Ibrahim. Ibrahim gives us a glimpse of what it means to sell water from the back of a donkey. I wrote the Ibrahim monologue from information and experiences gathered in the field over the years pertaining to donkey cart sellers, guinea worm, and how families manage the perils of water access. It was intended to more fully narrate and imagine the inner lives of those who sell water at the backs of donkeys and the consequences of their labor. I'm now at the edge of the pond, quite close to the donkey, and trying to hold a so it's, it's so jumpy, I apologize for that. Projected on two large screens are four sequential images from photographs I took one day at the pond of a young donkey cart seller and the video. Ibrahim is a boy about the age of 14 years. In various images, you'll see after this video, in various images, he stands with his donkey. Each image fades into the next as the following monologue is performed. The character Ibrahim stands on a platform just below the screen. His shadow is cast over half the screen. You can see the labor and care they're taking in um, 
closing and, and concealing and sealing those barrels. And you can also see the color of the water. And imagine the added labor when that water is sold and um, it's cleaned and purified at home. And you can also see the labor of the poor donkey as well. up the water pouring out of the barrels. You can, you can actually stop that and move on to the next one. So they actually um, start again in terms of putting water in the second barrel. Okay. This is the Ibrahim monologue. The boy Ibrahim enters a platform upstage left. Ibrahim. My name is Ibrahim. I'm from Savalugu. I am 14 years old and I sell water. I am what the people call a donkey cart water seller. I go down to the pond every day with my donkey and I fetch water. My younger brother goes with me. We travel about five miles every day back and forth to the pond. We sell water to the people here. There are other donkey cart water sellers, but we are the best. Some of the old people and the sick people can't carry the water or walk to fetch it. And the people who take care of them are too busy. The pond is too far. Sometimes the pond will dry up and we have to search for water. My brothers and me are very, very happy because we have our own donkey. We are blessed to have this donkey. We get up in the morning before the sun and we get a rope and we tie the rope to many, many buckets around the donkey's back. Then we start our first walk to the pond. Me, my brother, and the donkey get inside the pond where the water is full and plenty. My brother fills up the bowls and pours water in the bucket that we have fastened to the donkey's back. I hold the donkey very, very carefully so the donkey won't slide and fall down and spill the water back into the pond. The water is heavy. My brother pours and pours and I hold on. When the buckets are filled and my little brother's back is tired, we leave the pond. We start the journey with our donkey to sell water to the people who need it. When the water is sold, we go back to the pond and we start all over again. I hold on to the donkey and my brother fills up the buckets. We fetch water from the pond about four to six times a day. My mother worries that my brother and me will get the guinea worm from the water. Many people around here have gotten guinea worm from the water, but we have not gotten any guinea worm, not yet. My mother has guinea worm and my little sister my little sister was sick for a long time. You are very blessed when you don't get guinea worm because you can keep working and fetching water and making money to live. They pull the worm out of my little sister's leg and in a few days she felt better. Oh, it was a long, big guinea worm. It looked longer and bigger than my sister's leg. My mother said she could not fetch water anymore, so it's just my brother and me. If I get guinea worm, I will worry. Who will hold the donkey? My mother told me when she was a young girl, they had plenty, plenty water. Water flowed from the pipes, from the pipes every day. Now, she said they bathed and washed and drank and never got sick. 
no tired back, no guinea worm, no worry. When my mother was a young girl, fresh, clean water flowed from the pipes, but not anymore. Vandana Shiva says, we know that 2% of the people on this planet use 80% of the Earth's resources. This means that 80% of the world's population are not receiving their just share because of that 2%, unquote. The field, 2004, Accra, Ghana, the World Water Forum. My friend Al Hassan Adam attended the World Water Forum in 2003 in Kyoto, Japan to represent Ghana and its coalition against water privatization. There was scheduled to be a very important keynote presentation given by the former IMF managing director. The representative was scheduled to launch a report that basically entailed, according to Al Hassan, quote, how to finance water. The report was intended to focus on, quote, how the private sector can now go to public funds and then use public funds to finance water, unquote. There were anti-privatization activists from all over the world, Asia, Latin America, Africa, Europe, and the United States. When they found out in advance about the report, they decided they must do something about it. Al Hassan said, quote, we were really a rainbow, unquote. On the eve of the keynote, the activists held their own meeting and decided to protest the World Bank report. How were all of you going to protest the report, I asked him. He says, in the big meeting hall, where, all, where the report was to be given, there were going to be high officials and important people. It was organized by the World Water Council. One of the Japanese ministers from water was there, the South African minister for water and forests, ministers and development ministers, and everybody was there who was supposed to matter. The water chief executives, water activists, water technocrats, everybody was going to be there. So we activists had to dress very, very well. We could not get into the hall and we could not look suspicious. We did not want them to be aware of our plan, unquote. So you dressed up like them, I asked him, and it was a disguise so they wouldn't recognize all of you as activists? Exactly, he said. We made lied meters to stage our protest. We hid them under our coats so as we entered the hall, no one could see them. I was amused. I said, lied meters? Yes, said al -Hassan. The lie meters were made out of cardboard. We painted a red, orange, and brown arc on each meter. Attached to the bottom of the meter were small bells. There were about five of us who went into the hall with the lie meters under our coats. We stood in five different sections so, they would be, so we would be at strategic points in the room. When the World Bank fellow read his report, each time he told a lie, all of us would shake the meter and point the arrow in the direction of one of the colors. For the small lies, the meter would shake and go to brown. For the bigger lies, the meter would shake and go to yellow. For the biggest lies, the meter would shake and go to red. We had a fellow who signaled the color and the time to point in order to be sure we were all shaking at the same time and on the same point. One of the protesters would shine a light on him and he would then signal to us to shake and move the meter on the color. All five of us would move the meter at the same time and on the same color. Did anyone try to stop you? Did, did they speak to you or did they try to stop you in any way? Al Hassan shook his head, no. They couldn't. They were shocked. They were just absolutely shocked. Well, did the, did the World Bank guy, did he finish his speech? He started to fumble. Al Hassan said, the Japanese minister tried to persuade us to stop then. He said, we must speak to the issues. We spoke into the microphone and we began asking questions and speaking to the issues of privatization. We had six people stationed and there were two mics, three people at one side of the mic and three people at the other side of the mic. We really prepared and we did our homework for this. We knew what we were doing. 
We had met and we had planned and we had rehearsed our presentation very, very carefully. We let them know that all of us there, we represent so many people and you people are not representing anybody anymore on the count of all these lies you're telling. We want to have a dialogue. We did not come here to just listen to a report being read to us. After all this report took one year to prepare, and this is the first time we are hearing it, so we want a dialogue, said Al Hassan. They said, we'll give you 15 minutes. We, we are giving you 15 minutes, we said. You can't use one year to write a report and give us 15 minutes to respond to it, he said. This is not fair, and this is not democratic. We denounce the meeting, and we denounce your report. We don't recognize your report. This was a historic moment, I said. What happened next? We had two big banners, he said. It said, people before profit, and water cannot be sold. We went to the stage and covered the front of the stage with the banners, and we started chanting, water for life, not for profit. And then we just covered the whole platform. Nobody sees them again. Unquote. The protest at the World Water Forum becomes a genealogical thread and testament of a political beginning expressed through performance and as a method of intervention and praxis. <coughs> Al Hassan's narrative is another contribution to how performance and politics become reciprocal partners in generating and narrating the social consequences of a community of individuals and how in turn these individuals and communities make more performances in the continuum and spiraling forward of social justice. The performance at the World Water Forum was powerful because it was tactical at several levels. First, it relied heavily on surprise for its effectiveness. Sur surprise held a twofold purpose here. It was both a tactic and a maneuver to assure the activists would get into the space of the hall, and it also was a means to shock and therefore bring greater attention to themselves. Surprise also served as an important device because it added to the quality of spectacle by startling and jolting the audience. To enact surprise is to harness attention. You can hardly look away at a surprise. When you are jolted, your attention is focused and captured by the jolt. They needed to shock the audience into an entirely different register and mode of attention than what the audience expected to happen and what was happening before they entered the hall. Without this initial shock, it would have been more difficult to punctuate the moment. As Al Hassan stated, the activists wanted the big shots attending the meeting to be caught unawares, to ironically provoke them into the greatest possible awareness of their presence through surprise. Second, in succeeding to surprise the audience, the element of shock was complemented by a theatrics of inversion. The group of act activists literally created a reversal of positions relative to controlling the discourse of water privatization and how that discourse was now framed. The gentleman from the World Bank, who rep represents the most powerful economic institution in the world, was now usurped by people who, who will most likely never, ever, ever possess control or manage an iota of the amount of capital, capital he deals with at the bank. The tenacity and will of the activists displaced the speaker in an act where subaltern voice is silenced in a particular moment in time, a voice from the high ground of world finance. This inversion that contributed to globalization from below was no small inversion maneuver. The tactic also inverted the form and content of the discourse from speaker audience to agitprop performance happening full of the theatrics of costume, props, cues, dramatic effect, and the passion to reverse and reinvent power arrangements. Third, the inversion was enabled by design, a well thought out and conceived plan for a specific function and purpose. 
the performance was methodically arranged from the coordination of what would be worn, the graphics of the lie meter, the synchronization of the ringing bells, the timing of the flashlight cues, the, to the climactic moment of mounting the stage and dropping the, man, the banner to literally and figuratively mask the panel as they disappeared from sight and sound under the excessive appearance and boldness of the banner as both prop and signification of water cannot be sold. The event and its components of surprise, inversion, and design transformed a diverse group of internationalist activists into a momentary community of mutually empowering comrades. The privatization ideology by the sheer force of the performance was suspended, relinquishing the last word to the activists. The event unleashed the possibility of more performance from below to be remembered and revived. Making ethnographic performance. I have stated that to create for the stage the living performances of everyday remembrances, imaginings, and deeply felt encounter encounters of ethnographic fieldwork is a radical act of translation. Doing performance ethnography is a radical act of translation because it not only constitutes the crisis of representation, the symbiotic relationship between macro and micro forces, the always unresolved engagement with otherness, the geopolitical gap between the ones who freely come and go and the ones who stay, but all this and more must be translated multidimensionally for the stage in for the public, a public translation of which the other more than likely will never see. And at still another level of translation is the factor of verisimilitude. In the labor of staging ethnography, verisimilitude by replication is not the goal, but how well the enlivenedness of the metaphor works. This means giving a nod to Roman Jacobson, the idea of replicating what happened in the field must be replaced by the idea, idea that the metaphor, the performance, is actually comprised of, and in fact, can be more accurately understood as a metonym. I bring you but only an element to represent a greater whole. It is really about the metonym and how well we can re represent, embellish, and honor elements of the ethnographic world, encapsulations and their reverberations to make the audience feel a sense of being present within a greater whole. Therefore, my deepest ethical dilemma in staging ethnographic data is not the absence of the other who cannot be there to see the show, but how and by what means I can make the audience who is there feel a sense of being present with the other in the other's actual absence. What metonymic elements within the thick description of ethnographic habitation and co-performance can I create to form a metaphoric whole that represents the other's subjectivity and the formations of that subjectivity, subjectivity beautifully, memorably, disturbingly, to the point where my audience feels present with others in their world? Moreover, how can I create a performance where the audience is both inspired and disturbed by feeling being present in that world? This ethnographic sense of presence is not the same, but a complement to theatrical presence, a shared temporality, an aura, a vulnerability of aliveness, of being there together with the performance. This ethnographic present is adding a reversal to theatrical presence. It also is arguing here that being present in this ethnographic sense is something discreetly different than empathy because it involves more than I feel your pain. It is the sense of being transported to a place where you begin to feel that you may actually have a stake in the way the other world works. You feel you want to respond to it. Also, the sense of being present is not a mood toward the Derridian metaphysics of presence as a hierarchy of truth, but toward Shannon Jackson's epiphanal moment where distinct pieces, 
distinct phenomena, metonymic ontologies combine and converge to momentarily transport you to a time and space you have never been before in a way that haunts you, in a way that you cannot shake it off. It is a utopian performative for me because the audience feels the urge to react, or you hope they'll feel the urge to react. But should the sense of being present prevail? In making water rights, there are moments when the sense of being present was actually disrupted by its opposite, the feeling of alienation. It was the dialectic between presence and alienation that formed the mounting rhythm of the show and that were grounded in the power of juxtaposition. Throughout the show, various forms, texts, ideas, opposites were positioned and placed side by side to create a different and new meaning and sensation. The side by side arrangements both deconstructs and reconstructs through a proximic of both nearness and contrast. What is different about an element is further emphasized by its nearness or its closeness to its opposite. Yet it is this very nearness that dissolves separation by bringing them together in the creation of something altogether new. For example, it was important to present the basic arguments against the corporate privatization of water, but I did not want it to be didactic. Therefore, I used parody by creating a comic character called Mr. Big. This scene was an assortment of juxtapositions. While the lofty and pompous Mr. Big was boasting in his boardroom on the virtues of corporate privatization, placed in juxtaposition directly above his head and projected on the screen stage right was a rather simple-minded, obtuse PowerPoint demonstration entitled Three Myths of Privatization. Mr. Big's pseudo-intellectual posturing against a sophomoric oversized PowerPoint display was meant to illuminate the hidden contradictions and convolutions of water business, or what water activists call big water, and to deconstruct key just justifications given by pro proponents of privatization. The second juxtaposition, and more dramatic, was placing the funky poet's funky breakdown scene directly stage left of Mr. Big's boardroom. The funky poet, funky breakdown scene were a group of super cool funky spoken word poets slamming Mr. Big's corporate language and demeanor one by one with their irreverent body insults. But just as physical juxtaposition was employed, there were moments where psychological juxtaposition was also important. One example is a psychological binary within the inner world of the ethnographer herself. Two actors performed a kind of ambiguous representation of me, a kind of me and not me, if you will, or more precisely, what we understand as a narrative I and the narrative me. These two performers were placed side by side in this particular scene as recorder one and recorder two. R1 was downstage center speak speaking directly to the audience and R2 was upstage on a platform speaking directly to R1. The physical juxtaposition underscored a psychological juxtaposition within the binary of the ethnographic self that knows and the ethnographic self that questions her own knowing. In this instance, self-reflexivity was performed, but even more, the performance took on a drama of inner conflict, one self battling with the intention of the other self. This was the scene. It's taken from Anne Christian Slaunder's Water Business, Corporation versus People. Recorder one. In KwaZulu Natal, South Africa, they arrest Mr. Sule and put him in prison, put him in a prison cell. He had stolen water. What happened? Mr. Sule earned 100 rand a month selling water, but eventually he could not afford to pay the water bill. He also had to pay for food and shelter for his family and school fees for his children. 
His family needed water and he could no longer stand by and watch his children beg for it. Mr. Sule made an illegal connection to the, to the supply pipe. When it was discovered, the police came and put him in jail. What does Mr. Sule have to do with you? What are you doing here in Ghana? It's about water. I need to know more. I need to do water. You need to know. You need to do. What is it you need to know you need to do? There are big people with big money who want to own water. And? And they want to sell it. And? And they want to manage it and make a profit. And? And there will be people who cannot afford to pay for it. Oh. But what has that got to do with you, nosy woman? Stay out of other people's business. Profit and privatization have always been the twins of progress. You know what they say. God provided the water, but not the pipes. There will be people who cannot afford to pay for it. Read my lips. Water business, management, distribution, maintenance, pipes, pipes, pipes. Water is not free. Water cannot be owned. Water is a public good. The public will manage it. The public should profit from it. The public, oh, the public schmuggling, ha. Huh. The public in the developing world economies, oh, that public has been very successful so efficient, so honest, and so concerned about the public good. Yes, yes, getting water to all the people all the time, concerned about all its, all its poor citizens, never an ounce of corruption or water or just not knowing what the hell they're doing. Yes, leave it to the government of these countries. After all, they have done so well, done so well. You do not understand. You haven't been paying attention to it. it. It is, let me explain to you. The, prob, the problem is, the problem is the public sector has done so well as the water pipes break down everywhere, as the water collectors take money from the people and put the money in their own pockets, as the government water companies overcharge, mischarge, undercharge, or don't charge for water they mismanage, all the while making a messy waste of natural resources. Some people around here haven't had water flowing from their pipes in weeks and months. You are not looking below the surface. You do not know what you're talking about. You do not know anything. It is more complex. It is much more complex. Oh, it's more complex. It's much more complex. Maybe if the big people come with their big plans and their big money and their big pipes and their big teams and their big, 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 big promises, maybe people in this country can get some water, clean, fresh, efficient water. You don't understand. Really, you don't understand what's going on. You are missing the point. You just don't understand. Then make me understand. Help me understand. Tell me what I need to know and do. Tell me the truth. You are taking up space and getting in the way. Tell me what is the truth and what needs to be done. She is grasping. The truth is, the problem, it's, 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 it's complex. What is complex? I'm learning. It's here. I've got to get to it. I'm here. I will be here. Learn what you came here to learn. Don't give me slogans and platitudes. I am so tired of slogans and platitudes. Can you say something different about water? Can you say something more, recorder? There is no replacement for water. No replacement. Know what you came here to do. And then both recorder one and recorder two come together. There is more to know here, and I will be here. 
I will be here. I will come to be here. And we must understand. In conclusion, if performance is about anything, it's about affect and truth. A wonderful teacher once told me that art is about making layers and layers of truth in the interest of emotion. Margaret Thompson Drool stated that for the Yoruba artists, beauty is not as we conventionally define beauty. That is pleasing to the eye. But it is how close the art objects depict truth. However grotesque or frightening the appearance, if art pulls you into the undercurrents of a deeply felt recognition, a profound and intricate resolve, however momentary, then it is beautiful because it is truthful. It is this combination of affect, beauty, and truth that also helps me under, unearth the tyrannical side within claims and truth regimes. We know truth is historical. The greatest enemy of any one of our truths may be the rest of our truths, said William James. I tore myself away from the safe comfort of certainties through my love for truth, and truth rewarded me, said Simone de Bouvier. Art and performance seeks truth that is blasphemous. George Menard Shaw said, all great truth begins as blasphemies. Ye shall know truth, and the truth shall make you mad. Aldous Huxley. If art pulls you into a deeply felt recognition, a profound resolve, it is beautiful. The combination of affect, truth, and beauty means that these stories in Ghana must travel. The performance ended with R1 and R2 contemplating the power of truth the small story, and what is meant by the ethnographic performance project, and how the ethnographic performance project is always about a story that travels. Okay, you can do the final scene. In the, vinyl, in the very final scene, recorder one and recorder two come together and contemplate this notion of truth through travel as slides are shown from scenes from Ghana. Recorder one, truth is elusive, R2, but it demands our attention, R1. It doesn't stay in one place or breathe inside one story, R2, but it can. We've got to find those one places and those one stories. We've got to search Truth demands our attention in the multitudes of its yearnings. We've got to fight for it. We are not alone, are one. We can see and listen deeply past the obtuse blindness of appearances and the paralyzing silence of too much noise, are two. Deep past the lies reborn again and again by the greedy and the lazy, are one. We will search for truth in the multitudes of the one story, R2. The one story that is always here and there and in everywhere, details of life lived on the hard edge blades of truth's teeth, R1. It will hurt. It always does. Because truth's blade cuts deep, deep at the skin and bone of what it implies. R1. The implication? R2. Yes, the implication that breaks your heart and demands a search for more truth, more truth, more. R1. Do we feel our hearts breaking from the teeth? R2. Sometimes. But more than breaking, we feel our hearts swelling as if it is about to burst open into flames. R1. Burst from what, R2? Burst from the fear and hope of finding the right question to spark the right story that will unleash an avalanche of truths, R1. Bursting from the fear and hope of how we will carry these stories back, 
so they will not soften the teeth of truth or dull its blade? R2. We are bursting from how we will listen and wrap words around the stories that we must carry back. R1. Back home? R2. Back here? R1. Back everywhere. The words we wrap around truth's teeth will fly past us and carry themselves beyond our reach. We make retold stories, R1. Every retold story becomes a traveling story, retold far beyond the presence of our own body, R1. Retold for truth's sake, to harden the teeth and sharpen the blade, yes. Our hearts are bursting and not breaking from the weight of the search, the weight of the question, the implication, but most of all, most of all, from the weight of carrying these truths truly, R1. Yes, beyond our reaches and beyond the starting point of the one true story, R2. And you can go to Water Rights Digital Pictures from the show. We are not of this place. This is not our home, R2. We live in the richest country in the world, R1. This is a fact. What should we do about it, R2? Use it like a blade of fire against its own flame, R1. For truth's sake, R2. Yes. And for the sake of hearts on the verge of exploding, R1 and R2. Yes, and for the sake of hearts on the verge of exploding. Thank you. These final slides are slides from the actual show, Water Rights. Thank you. to do a performance about water and describe what I hope that performance would look like in terms of people uh, wanting to, most everybody knew that I had been in Ghana all these years doing this work on water rights. So I put posters and um, little bills all over uh, uh, the performance studies department stating that I wanted us to do a devised performance on water that would uh, be collaborative with me on my um, water, on my water um, field research. And uh, people came, and uh, we, we had a discussion one-on-one -on -one about what the responsibilities of this would be. And those folks who wanted to be a part of it were a part of it. Not everybody actually performed. Some people did costumes. Some people did stage work. But everybody was sort of in Yes. Two questions. What was the running time of the production? The running time. Uh, it was about an hour and forty-five minutes. And the other question is, what what kind of dialogue have you seen come out of this performance? I mean. Obviously, here, which is great too. But what else has happened? Um, a couple of things have happened. I've had students who have gone on to work with different water organizations. Um, I've also had students who have decided that they want to do this kind of devised performance around political issues, particularly doing field work. Um, I also have folks that are still contacting the students from Chapel Hill and contacting me about, because in the program there was a list of organizations that they could join 
All right. And we asked that they check in with us if they wanted to, if they were still working with, this, with these organizations, what were some of their experiences. And I have gotten, as well as the students, several folks that said that they had gone on to join um, some of these organizations. Um, this, this performance is also in a uh, book, the, the entire script. And I get calls saying that people are using some of those sections in their classes, and some of them are also performing sections of them. What I wanted more than anything else was for people to feel that um, if they wanted to do something about this, there were places, there were organizations, there were groups that were doing these kinds of things, and they could simply join those or inquire. But there, there, there is work on this. It's not that this performance is the first or that those of us who are part of this performance are inventing this question, all right? Um, and what I most wanted to do was with our, with our performance um, participants, the collaborators, I really wanted us to build our own kind of community, our own kind of extended family, all right? And that this would be... Uh, a way for them to be in this performance, but it would also be a tr kind of training ground for them to continue this process of <coughs> these kinds of device performances. Yes. How, how long was your rehearsal process? I mean, when did you start with everyone? And I mean, how long was that? And what did all of this come out of the Looking at the, the scenery, the boxes, the, the floor treatments, the lighting, all that, did that come out of a lot of this, or did you walk in with a lot of... No, we started with no script, with nothing. And we did this in seven weeks. Seven. In seven weeks. There were a lot of folks that were helping out and that wanted to be a part of this. And we were able to do it in seven weeks because we did have a lot of people on board. All right. And I think by design, we really planned it. You know, our distribution of labor was very clear. Um, and it did take, it was a lot of time and sacrifice for the students because we would meet during regular class time, but we would also meet in the, af in the evenings after school. So it was though they were in a regular show, all right, with regular rehearsal times after, after class. Um, and we would also meet on weekends. We didn't necessarily rehearse. Most weekends we didn't rehearse. Most weekends was spent, you know, coming together with food. You know, we bring food and we just eat and spend a Sunday afternoon talking about the show and looking at films and documentaries on water and just being reflexive about what we were doing. That was those were our Sunday afternoons. Yes. Do you plan on remounting this production anytime soon? I do not. <laughs> no, I do not. I'm, I'm on to another thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I can tell you that Ibrahim is many characters, okay? Ibrahim is many characters because Guinea Worm in Ghana at that time was second only to the Sudan. There were many, many people, in particularly northern Ghana, who were getting Guinea Worm, all right? And being a donkey cart seller, based on the interviews of donkey cart sellers that I met during the decade of field work that I was doing there, was telling this similar story, okay? And again, it was a matter of personalizing, individualizing that story in the character of Ibrahim so that it became, you know, someone that opened up, as we talked about earlier, a kind of path toward empathy in the best tradition of that word. Um, so it wasn't, you know, just there are a lot of folks selling uh, water off the backs of donkeys, and there are a lot of folks getting get, getting warm. But what if one identity tells that story right, in a very personal way? So that was the experiment with that in the show. Can you explain how there was once watering pipes and now there isn't? What's the uh, the 
kind of, I think the question is, what's yeah. the economic and political and social uh, reason for the, the pipes to no longer be flowing if they've got the infrastructure at one point? That's a really hard question. <laughs> That's a really, really hard question. But I, I will try to answer it this way. During the 70s, um, there was a really difficult uh, drought in Ghana. All right? um, and there was also a problem with the oil crises all right, that um, brought the value of the CD uh, down very low. Um, there was also a concern right after World War II. All right. So I know it's sounding it's very, it's still very confusing to me because it's a compilation of things what, that grew out of this notion of structural adjustment. All right. So with the economy just kind of bottoming out during the late 70s and early 80s, all right, um, with the depletion of the CD, with the problems of structural adjustment where the notion of public water that was connected to um, kind of accountability with the uh, public water system in Ghana, there became movements toward privatization where the forestry um, then became open to private businesses that um, had a very negative effect on ponds and streams because many people would get their pond, would go to the water and uh, get, get the water from these certain ponds and streams. All right? um, the other thing that would happen is there was this large um, migration from the rural areas into the cities that was not able to service this, this very heightened population of people. All right. And that also um, wreaked havoc on the water system. All right. So it was a combination, I think, of the economy changing through structural adjustment. It was a combination of the um, uh, CD and the value of, of the Ghanaian currency reaching a bottom. It was also um, the problem of folks not having the kind of employment that they had before, and there was a kind of middle class um, um, force in Ghana that uh, was able to support through taxation and through um, a kind of distribution of labor that was able to then uh, uh, reinvigorate um, the way the, 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 stru the pipe structure worked. Um, and, but let me just say this. One of the most difficult problems was this large migration pattern that happened from the villages to the cities where there was one uh, piped water source. It began then when people in, the, in certain village areas would go to the pond. The pond wasn't contaminated because of the forestry issues. But in the cities, all right. Um, it was toward the, the late 80s, one of those central pipes broke. All right. Um, the infrastructure was not in place, the economy was not in place to repair that. When I was there in 1998, it still had not been repaired. So they were working off one major pipe into the city. All right. That was responsible. I don't remember the figures. I have them in, in the book, but I don't remember what they were. Um, where you had two um, central pipes that were to populate, say, um, six large communities, all right? Now that one pipe was doing that work, so, pe so the water was not getting to these areas. So it was a breakdown of infrastructure, it was overcrowding of the cities. 
it was um, privatization of, of forestry and um, the like. I was wondering, you, you mentioned that a performance is metonymic as opposed to meta metaphoric, and the idea that um, it's also a process of translation, and you obviously went, it seems to me, you would have obviously gone through a process of translation as you're developing this over seven weeks. There are your students that uh, are looking at this material or engaging these films, and I would imagine they were, they, they were identifying the things that they saw as important in those mm -hmm in those stories, in, your, in the field notes that you shared with them. Would you be able to talk us through that moment, of, that type of translation where they identify something as important, they want to bring out something that's important, possibly you're looking at it and going, well, that's not what's really important about this story, something else is, or just that, that process of translation with those students engaging these materials. Right. What I shared with you today were those scenes that I wrote, OK? Um, so the scenes that you saw today were the scenes that I wrote based on my field work. So I think the question comes out of that as well because you have not, because uh, I, you have not um, read or seen some of the work that the students did. So that would give you a, a probably a greater idea of how the students were watching these films and reading these materials, and we were in rehearsal and talking about my field work, and they were talking about their experiences with water. All right. So the process came about this way. All right. They had materials. They had a, an abundance of research materials, just as I had an abundance of research materials that were field work materials. All right. We together would talk through that. They would ask me questions. I would ask them questions. All right. They were journaling every day during this process. All right. Just as I was journaling every day. So the way that they were describing the rehearsals and asking questions through their journals and speaking back to some of the document, documentaries they saw, those were in the journals. So a lot of this performance came out of their journal entries, all right? And then through so rehearsal, um, role-playing games, uh, looking at um, certain objects in the room, all right, and giving voice to those objects in the room, and what if those objects were transported from Chapel Hill to West Africa? How would it speak differently? Some of that made it into the performance. Um, we would when we listen to uh, um, most deaf's uh, World Water. How would you then perform your own um, song or your own poem or your own spoken word piece? that represents some of the stuff that you've read and some of the films that you've looked at, how would you speak to that as you have, you know, just engulfed yourself in all of this literature? How would you cast that to spoken word? All right, and let's just play with that just extemporaneously right now. And we would do that in rehearsal, and some of that made it into the piece, all right? Um, if you were to be a character, this is at a cocktail party. If we were at, can you think of a scene where people talk about water in ways that are completely antithetical to the message we want to bring in this show? What would that scene look like? Well, it might be a cocktail party. Well, how can we play off of that so that it becomes almost hyperbolic? Okay, and so in rehearsal, they were playing off this notion of the cocktail party and what you know, the super rich or very rich or the super uninformed might say about these things, all right? That ended up making it to the performance. Um, when uh, there was a piece that I wrote um, that represented a, a water activist, um, and as I was reading it to them, we were, I, I was asking them, well, what's not clear here? What do we need to do? You take this and rework it. But I want you to think about reworking it through dance. What would a dance of this speech look like? And so you see, I think Marie is there upside down with her legs up. So there were three women that made this dance. When I asked them about, well, can you, can you, can you articulate your first water story? What would that gesture look like? And they said, and, and let's think of it abstractly. They said, well, let's think about water just an infinite number of plastic water bottles being in a box. 
and I'm telling you my first water story. And as I'm telling you my first water story, I'm opening up this big box. And each box was decorated by the students in the way they wanted to. And the audience, they don't know what's in this box. So they're opening up this box. And what they find, they look. And the next thing you know, they're just throwing these water bottles all over the stage, all right? And they're thinking that they're somewhere between their first memory of water and what happens now when they drink water out of a water bottle, all right? And it, gets, it, looks, it feels almost fabricated. They lose touch with that, all right? It becomes mechanized in a way. It becomes uh, commodified in a way. Uh, when their first memories of water were water, when their father was washing, one story was the father was washing her hair. Another story was being caught in the rain, all right? But this is all water, water that's bottled and water that's part of your childhood. So they thought, we'll open up this box of memories. And what this box of memories really becomes are these plastic water bottles. So the plastic water bottles are now all over the stage. And then we said, but what is your real first memory of water that you can't remember? Being in the womb. So the students are now on the stage. Some of them are almost like in fetal position. Some of them are not. But they're lying on the stage under all of these water bottles. Um, that is suggestive of the ocean, that's suggestive of birth, the birth uh, canal, that is suggestive of um, just this perhaps imaginary utopian moment of peace and water, but they're, but they're surrounded by the water bottles, okay? So all of that, it's amazing, as you know, what can happen when you have all of this material that's talking about a particular idea and it takes you in the form in which you're dealing with that, this idea. The forms are multiple, from pictures to songs to you know, theoretical articles to propaganda. You know, all of these forms around this one idea and the act of translating not only uh, the subject but translating the forms out of which this, this particular subject takes place that is also a part of translating your own memory bank, you know, where you can join with the text to another level of translation where you have to think about how does this now become a three-dimensional um, experience on stage that is about the aesthetic. And when you have 11 people doing this, it will take you in all kinds of creative directions. All right. That is all the time we have okay. today. Thank you so much. <laughs>